Can I hang out with you? Okay, it's the end of the session. I'm here with the two dogs that we really didn't work with. This is Jalapeno, this is Birdie. Off camera, we have uh, Nugget. Nugget is a dog that was found in Tijuana. We don't know exactly what Nugget's backstory is, but Nugget is uh, growly and barky and lunchy. Towards her at times, she's very protective over one person in the home, uh, her primary guardian. This is a little bit of an unusual session for me. I did a little bit different order. We had a lot of questions, which were wonderful. The guardians here are very inquisitive and very knowledgeable, which is helpful. Um, so uh, first thing we, uh, after we talked about stuff was we went over marker words. Um, I have a video on marker words. If you forget how to do them, message me. I also am going to leave, well, you guys already have a clicker. So uh, this is really more for you now um, than this, but make sure you go around, click, treat, click, treat. I would do it with all the dogs. Uh, if you're going to use a clicker, I might just use it just there. Um, the problem is if you use a clicker, I don't want to have these guys coming over there. So maybe the clicker or um, yes is the marker word here only for her. Okay. Now that I think about it, I'd probably come up with a different uh, yes, good, nice, or thanks, the most common ones that we use or BN. Um, so I would come up with a different word for these two because I'm worried because she's a little protective. If you say yes and they run over to you expecting to get that treat, that might create a situation. So in this case, it's probably better for the dogs to have separate marker words. Um, okay, so we went over hand targeting. Practice that one a lot. Now, if guests or people come over and they want to engage with Nugget, remember we're going to hold out that hand to test engagement. If Nugget doesn't want to come over, turns its, her head or lowers her head, backs away, she's saying, I don't want to engage with that people person, and that's probably going to be the, while, the case for a while, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not her responsibility to get petted by everybody. That's other people. They can guide a teddy bear and get petted if they need really need to do it. Um, eventually, we want to get to the point, though, where... Uh, uh, when we have uh, the people are comfortable when you guys are not enough hand targeting what you could do is and I would probably have these guys away so you do a couple hand targets then your mom does a couple hand targets and then your guest is over there and your guest throws a hand down and if birdie goes over them she's giving consent she's saying yes I'm willing to engage with you now she's approaching a stranger if she feels comfortable if she doesn't that's okay but now she's approaching someone and she's having something good happen for approaching a stranger and so it's a good way of testing whether or not she's comfortable with that interaction or not uh, let me see, we also went over um, what I like to call petting with a purpose. Petting with a purpose is essentially petting your dog for a reason. Now these dogs I think get petted so much that they don't really have to ask for it. And is it petting a dog wrong? No, but anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're specifically reinforcing as long as it's not an emotion. And you can't reinforce emotions. And so if the dog jumps up and I pet the dog, then I'm kind of telling the dog jumping up on me is a great way to get me to give you attention. So what we like to do instead is tell the dog to ask the dog to sit or lay down, provided they know how to sit or lay down. You can also hand, do hand targeting. I would not ask for the shake because you already saw what happens with the shake. So if a uh, nugget comes up to me and sits down, uh, or is, it comes up to me and is looking at me saying, hey, I want your attention, I'm gonna say sit. Nugget has two seconds to sit. If nugget sits, then I would say yes and pet her under the chin, on the chest or on her shoulders, provided she doesn't move away. If I say sit and she doesn't sit, I'm gonna lean back, I'm gonna play a little bit, give uh, this little jalapeno dog some circles on her chest, play a little bit with my buddy Birdie, check my email for phones, for uh, emails, watch some TV, play video game, whatever else is. I'm not gonna punish Nugget. I'm just not gonna give Nugget the attention she wanted because she didn't do what I asked her to do, even though it's very small. This will motivate her next time to be more interested in doing what I asked her to do. And so if I say sit and she sits, and I say yes and pet her, and if she doesn't, I play hard to get. Eventually, she'll start sitting down, and I would do it with all the dogs. The dogs will start sitting in front of you and ask to, uh, to try to prepay for the attention. And when they do, make sure that you pet them. Your tootsie is so cold, I'm just trying to warm it up for you. Um, and so eventually, the dogs are sitting to ask for attention. That's a very polite thing. Remember to use the watchword of manners. If you suspect someone has forgot to pet the dog, the dog's standing, and you see your brother petting, and you say, manners, even if your brother did it right, he says, stops, sit, the dog sits, yes or whatever their marker word is and pets them under the chin and then explains to you, actually, I did it right, you missed it. Um, it's just a way to get you guys on board. It's gonna take you about two, a little over two months to get in the habit of doing this. The reason this works is if everybody does it all the time, a whole bunch of times throughout the day. If you only do it once or twice, you try to do it for a week and stop doing it, it won't work very well. So get in a habit because it's one of the easiest things you can do that will have the most profound impact. The easiest by far that will have the most profound impact is uh, the, uh, what I call celebrating or capturing waiting for the dog to offer the behavior on its own. So every time Nugget lays down, yes, and pet her. Every time that she comes to you, yes, and pet her. Looks at your face, yes. Drinks water, dr eats her food, goes to the dog bed, drops something. You didn't ask her to drop, but she drops a toy, yes. And then go pet her or give her a treat. 
And the more that we pet our dog for the things that we want, more the dog will offer those particular behaviors. And eventually we have a dog that just comes up and drops the ball to say, hey man, let's go play fetch. And that's a really great thing. To now, uh, for the drop it, um, I would continue doing the things that we went over here today. The ball, the lower value ball, the, the tug toy or whatever it is, just when she has, every time she has one, quietly pull out a treat, walk over to her, hold it in front of her nose, don't say anything. Well, actually now she's starting, if she's starting to do it, you say drop, as long as you're 90% certain she's gonna do it when you say it. So you drop, she spits it out, you put it in her mouth, and the first couple times, don't pick up the item. That's the mistake most people make, and that makes the dog not wanna drop it. So I pick it up, and if the dog's not interested again, like what happened with Nugget, then I can pick up the ball, and then we bounce a couple times to throw it. Dog goes and gets it. Playing fetch is a wonderful way to burn energy. So maybe you throw it, she runs and gets it, and then she looks at you and you're holding a treat. She runs over to you, drops that ball. You say yes and give her that treat. And eventually what I would do is I would say fetch as I throw it. She runs over and gets it, runs back up to you. You're holding the treat, she drops the ball. You put it in her mouth, you've now taught your dog to fetch. It's a wonderful way to burn energy. Um, so uh, capturing or celebrating is just rewarding the dogs when they do things you want. Make a list of all the cues that you, things you want them to teach them to do. Sit, come, lay down, look at you in the eyes, go to the dog bed, eat their food, drink their water, go potty. Um, and every time the dog does those things on their own, we pet them and we say the marker word and pet them or reward them. And we use celebrate to tell our partners to make sure they're doing the right thing as well. Now, uh, the guardians were asking about loose leash walking. Loose leash walking is more complex than I'm going to go in this video, but I'm going to give you a couple quick tips. Exercising your dogs before the walk can have a more productive walk. I would like to see this dog, uh, Birdie, and Nugget walking together at least once a day. I want a separate handler for each person in case something happens so we have full control of the situation. Uh, it'd be nice if Nugget is wearing actually a harness as opposed to a collar. And you might use a martingale um, collar just that if you size it properly, she won't ever be able to pop it off. Sometimes they can back out of harnesses. Your dog's wearing a harness, they start going backwards, walk with them. Don't let them back up because that's how they slip the harness. Uh, and if dogs slip the harnesses, then we usually put a martingale on as well as the harness and clips on both of them. So that way if they slip the harness, the, the collar's still there. So what you're doing is um, what we did on the walk. So we went outside and we're gonna let the dog sniff as much as possible. Um, now, if she's not paying attention, what we'll do is walk maybe 10 paces and stop and then, it, or walk until she pulls on a leash. As soon as she pulls on a leash, um, you can do a couple things. One of the things I like to do, as soon as the dog pulls on a leash, I make a kissing sound like this and you want to watch her. Wow, she didn't do it at all. I know, you think she's going deaf and she's tired. Most dogs are going to turn around. That's called a positive interrupter. So I have a treat in my hand first. I have the leash in this hand. I'm walking down the street and as soon as she uh, nuggets the end of the leash, I say, or, or uh, birdie. I, and, the, and I hold the treat out. The dog turns around and it looks like I'm holding a treat. And I try to hold it behind the seam of my pants. The dog practices coming back to me. When it gets right about here, I say yes. Then I give it the treat. Then we continue walking. As soon as she gets to the end of the leash again, I stop, plant my feet. And again, she can go wherever she wants. I'm going to pivot and keep my pelvis pointed towards her, but I'm going to stay in that one pivot spot. And when she gets done, and when she gets bored, she's going to say, Man, why, can't, why are we going? Uh, or, as soon, or as soon as she looks at you, you're saying your marker word and holding the treat out. Now you can also make the kissing sound when she gets to the end of the leash, which will get her to turn, and then you're holding that treat out as well. So those are two different little tricks that you can do for that. Um, and, and then you can also do that hand targeting. Uh, that's another nice thing to get the dog to come back to you. But make sure that you're giving your dog full access to the leash. Don't hold it short, because I think that the, there's been a lot of short, not a lot, but there's not been enough short leashing. I think the dogs are pulling because they don't have any leash. They don't have any choice but to pull. The more that we let them kind of do their thing, hopefully the less, snip, uh, less they do, but if we also combine it with that uh, checking in, wait for the dog to stop playing our feet and wait for them to look, and when they do, we say marker and hold that treat out, or we say the kiss, make a kissing sound when they're walking down the street, then eventually they come back to us and then they get more used to it. Right now, I think they're more used to pulling to get away. Now for her, she likes to come back to the house. She's a homebody. When we're coming back, we might, when you turn around, you might just like do that find a uh, get it game, like every yard. So show her you have a treat, throw, make sure they're high value treats like the treat trainers I have. And if she doesn't do that on the walks, then just do it in your front yard. Just walk outside and do it in your neighbor's yard a couple times, then let her come back inside. And then go out there again. And after a while, she's like, I like the sniffing in the neighbor yard for treat thing. And then you could start doing it in the next neighbor's yard, in the next neighbor's yard. And so the idea is we're making a positive interaction or you could have somebody uh, in, uh, come by and maybe you walk her down the street and on this side, you're letting her sniff you let her sniff wherever. But on this side, you put little, some shredded uh, Swiss cheese and little uh, pockets on every yard. So now, on the way back, she, there's a pocket of cheese. You lead her right up to it. She's sniffing the cheese, licking it up. Then she goes and does it again. 
if you make it really fun and there's a lot of interactive things for the dog on the way back, then she's going to be looking for those things instead of just wanting to make a beeline back. Also remember I, uh, asking for the sit. I like to use the sit as an indicator. So I tell the dog to sit. If the dog can't sit, it's probably too stimulated to listen to me for me to go further. So once the dog can't sit, I stop continuing to move forward. Instead, I might turn around and go back or do some hand targeting or some way to get the dog to re-engage with me. And make sure that one of the things you're celebrating in the house is eye contact. So if you don't do it in the house, you're, if you're not, the dog's not practiced, it's not gonna do it so much on the walk when there's a lot more distractions. So you're hanging out and the dog looks at you, yes, but simple as that, it doesn't take a, a lot. But now, and, and after a while, then your dog starts looking at you more and more frequently and getting more attention for it, then that, that's gonna be easier for you to get them to do that outside on walks. Let me see, um, we also talk about creative forms of exercise, sniffing on walks, let your dog sniff as long as it's safe to do so. Playing tug of war is a great way to burn energy. Tossing the ball, playing fetch like we talked about earlier. And you also might find that there's a certain amount of exercise that sets up certain activities. Maybe before we have our brother come home, maybe we need to have 12 fetches. And then 10, remember after a heavy exercise, you need 10 minutes to rest to catch the breath. But maybe before um, we have a house guest come over, we need 25 fetches. So you might, you'll kind of try it out. So try 20 fetches and then the house guest come in and see how well she behaves. Next, if it wasn't perfect, then maybe next time try 25 fetches and then give her 10 minutes rest and have the house guest come in, see how that works. You might find that there's a butter zone, a right amount where she really enjoys or performs better. And then we can use that combined with the medication, combined with other exercise, other things and distractions to help the dog practice not having bad experiences. Remember, what I do is really kind of formulating curated experiences, which is why walking her on the street is not ideal because you, you don't know when a dog's gonna come out of a house or turn around. I know it's not very convenient, but going to a place where there's a big field, um, I don't know what it is, I'm like, is it like Third Street? There's those big, you know what I'm talking about? Ocean Park. There's like third or fourth, there's like a couple soccer fields. I don't know if it's Santa Monica High School or whatever it is, but there's some big fields in there. Probably times during the day when there's nobody there. So you find out when that time is, and then you take Nugget there and walk Nugget there. If somebody starts walking towards you, you got a whole football field. You can move far enough away. The idea is to manage the situation so Nugget doesn't ever have to growl because my guardian is controlling the situation and not allowing anybody to get close enough. And once I've gone on a couple of walks without growling, that becomes a little bit more likely to happen. And after we get to about two months, then that starts to become the default behavior. And then instead of growling, the dog's sniffing the ground looking for fun stuff. Now we didn't, uh, I went over basically the engaged, uh, not the engaged, the uh, front approach sit game. And there's a video above this from our puppy classes. Now we didn't get a chance to really work on it too much. I guess we did work on it, but the key for that is when you're holding the treat, I like to hold the treat like this. A lot of people hold the treat here and you can't see jalapeno's face when I do that. So I'm holding it here where I'm holding the, the treat here and my hands here. So I can have the dog uh, with this under the dog's chin and I can kind of control what the dog's looking at. During the front approach sit game, it's really important that Nugget is looking at the person who is approaching. Now, the differences in the video is the video is for puppy classes to make sure the puppies don't have a guarding behavior. Um, but the same technique will work for this as well. So what you're gonna do is have the person walk, but as soon as Nugget growls, remember they have to stop and you take note of what that distance is, three guitars or whatever it is, and then they walk away. And if Nugget's still grumbling, have them leave the room and do a couple hand targets, get Nugget kind of relaxed. Then the person comes back in and they stop if it was 10 feet when Nugget growled. After they leave and reset, they come in, they walk up and they might stop at 12 feet before Nugget growled. And really what we're looking for is Nugget going from an open mouth like this to a closed mouth. So if she does that, that would be where the line is. Because I don't want the dog to practice reacting because when she reacts and the person goes away, that's exactly what she wants that reinforces that behavior. What we want to do is find as far away as we can stop where she doesn't feel threatened so she doesn't growl. And the whole time we're just feeding treat, treat, treat as the person's walking as fast as you can get in your dog's mouth at first. Yes. And then uh, as soon as the person turns and walks away, and they're not going to go past whatever that threshold line is that you've determined earlier when she closed her mouth or growled or whatever, preferably closing the mouth. So they walk up and then they, when they get to the line, they just turn and walk the other direction. As soon as they turn around, you stop delivering treats. And you want to do like five or six passes at that distance. And then try one step past that after five to six, six successful passes, then try adding one more step. Did it go well? Then repeat that five or six times. And then you could try it again. And the idea is you'll probably get a couple of steps. The closer you get to the dog, the harder it gets. But this is something that you can practice a couple of times a day 
Um, and don't practice so much that the dog doesn't like it. And afterwards, try to give her a massage or to give her some treats or go for a walk or do something she really likes. So Nugget doesn't look at this as a really negative. And this is gonna drain energy. But we can exercise her a little bit before this to set her up for success, give them 10 minutes to rest, and practice this for like a minute. And it's gonna be a hard, you know, not a hard minute, but it's gonna be a very energy draining minute. But the idea is we're gradually teaching Nugget that when mom comes or my brother or a house guest or whoever it is, that that isn't something to disagree or growl at because that means I'm about to get a treat. So we're gonna say the marker, oh, well, I'm trying to think when I say the marker word in this one. So basically I would, what I would do is when the person, uh, right before the person's gonna turn, I would say the marker word. So the, the person's approaching, treat, 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 treat. And as soon as the person's about to turn, say yes, because you're saying you're marking the dog not growling. And then the person turns and walks away and then repeats that. And so you're gonna do a whole, that person's gonna be doing a whole bunch of walking back and forth and that's okay. Um, now make sure you practice that in different parts of the house in different directions, go this way and then approach the dog that way. Um, and eventually when you get to the point where the, your brother or whoever the person is can walk all the way up to the dog and then they're gonna give the dog a treat and pet if the dog feels comfortable then they're ready to do it with the dogs. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna have uh, uh, Birdie on a leash walking towards Nugget who's there. And if Nugget wants to get up and move away, that's, as I talk about in the video, that's okay. That's Nugget's way of saying I'm uncomfortable. But eventually we're gonna do the same, pr same principle and procedure, but eventually we're getting Birdie closer and closer and she starts to identify Birdie coming closer is a good positive thing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about management and maintenance because uh, Birdie's a little bit concerned, rightly so. So one, do you guys have any X-Pens? Yeah, X-Pen is uh, uh, eight panels of fencing that you can create a temporary barrier. So one of the things you might do when you're doing that is to set up the X-Pen and then you could have a uh, little jalapeno inside. So that way Nugget can't get to jalapeno if something bad is happening or you can put it up or baby gate in the doorway or wherever it is. So having those safeguards are really important, like for the sliding door that you guys have in the, in the kitchen or whatever that is, I would get some sort of a hook or something that goes on the door and everybody in the house would put a post-it note on the, both sides of the door. Hook is down or you know, tag is up. Don't open the door without checking because we're probably having the other dog loose because all it takes is somebody to rock in at the wrong time. Um, now I'd like to have the dogs po uh, creating positive associations. How's head? this table pretty heavy? Is it pretty durable? It looks, okay. If it's durable, then what you can do is take a leash, run around one of the legs and run it through the handle of the leash and tether it to the dog's collar. And then one dog, and then the other dog's made by the piano or something like that over there. The tether, I don't want them pulling on a leash. If they're pulling on a leash, then that may, we, we got them too close, we're setting up to fail. What we'd like the dogs to do is have shared experiences, going for those walks together on a daily basis. And if you have to be this far apart, that's fine. So you have human, human, and then the dog's on the outside. You've got to stay here. We don't want you going to where Nugget is. Um, and then basically we can eventually get closer and closer where the humans are humans and the dogs are on the outside, but they're close enough and the dogs are having a shared experience. They're both smelling each other, seeing each other, hearing each other, practicing being together without any animosity or anything aggressive going on. And that's a really important thing. We have to build up as many positive experiences as we can. Um, also getting them lick mats. So one dog's over here, one dog's over there. As long as they're not staring and licking, uh, staring and growling at each other, then it's too close. You might have one over here and one way over there in the kitchen or past that doorway. As far enough as we, we need to make it where the dogs will sit and lay down and lick that lick mat. Licking releases endorphins. I like the lick mats that have the suction cups so they can't take it around or whatever. So the dogs maybe are 20 feet apart licking the uh, lick mat and then maybe after that for a couple days without and they're both comfortable and content, we move it to like one step, one foot closer and one foot closer. Now the goal is not to get the lick mats right together. That would be asking for a disaster. All what the dogs do is practice being in the room together, good things happening without any of the negatives. Now we also need to make sure that we are keeping Nugget away from things that are gonna, where Nugget can practice that behavior. So I would really highly recommend is you set it up so that people are calling or texting each other when they're on their way home. So that way we can be prepared. We can exercise Nugget a little bit ahead of time and then we can make sure that Nugget is on a leash that birdie is away or whatever the situation is, or we're, we're sitting here and the person's gonna come in and go that way, then we might wanna be over here practicing the exercise so that the, dog, the person isn't passing by us. And if like your brother's carrying in surfboards, then that's not probably a good time to have uh, Nugget out here because Nugget is gonna growl. So instead, go back in your room and spend three minutes practicing an exercise, you know, teaching your dog different uh, cues and let your brother bring all that stuff in. Carrying stuff around or moving stuff is really, a lot of dogs are not going to like that, especially if they're anxious and nervous. And so we want to try to prevent her from being exposed to anything that's going to help her practice 
we have clearly the behavior that we don't want. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, and so the more that we can build up positive associations, we'd like to do a couple of those a day. So we can get a walk and a lick mat together. Maybe you're doing uh, a training exercise with one of the dogs and your brother is working with Birdie over here, five or six feet away. So Birdie's more interested in hanging out with your brother because he's getting treats from your brother. You're over here and the dogs are practicing, listening to you and ignoring the other person. Um, Trying to think, snuffle mat, I would again get a snuffle mat and feed, uh, well, probably, these guys are pretty mellow, but if she, you know, she needs a little exercise, you can feed her out of one as well. And then feed uh, half, uh, maybe a little, get a little bit of dry kibble uh, and put that in the snuffle mat and let her eat that first. And when she eats all that, then take her into the kitchen or wherever the place is for the, the raw food. The raw food is going to be better uh, for her, but this won't, this will allow you to drain some energy. Um, and kind of come up with a rhythm. Exercise is best done every two to four hours. So again, you can use exercise to set the dog up for success, but we want to not just give them a long walk in the morning and a long walk in the evening, because then in the middle of the day, they have all this extra energy. I hear a sound outside and I bark at it, and I'm practicing that particular behavior. Um, remember, any growl or, or growling is a communication. I'm uncomfortable, that is too close to me, or I, in her case, I think I disagree as well. She might also do it when she's excited. So that's why, again, we want to try to avoid having her around anything that's going to cause her to do that barking. Um, and I know it's easier said than done, but just do it the best job that you can. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, when the dogs are mellow, Birdie's pretty mellow right now. Jalapeno's pretty mellow. So is she. This is a great time to get the dogs together. When people are watching a football game, that's not a good time to have the dogs together. We're yelling. We got strange guests here. There's all sorts of calamities. We're setting the dogs up potentially to fail. So um, that's a trigger stacking. It's something you might want to look up. Uh, but it's just a whole bunch of things that happen in a row that just put the dog over its threshold. And we're setting the dog up to fail. So again, you know, try to avoid those sort of things. You know, people are going to come over and watch a football game. Then maybe that's the day that you go out on a hike. You know, and so when, you're, when they're watching the game and making all these hoop whooping noises, you're got, uh, hugging with the dog. When you come back, you go in your bedroom. She's pretty tired. You hang out in there with her. And then she's relaxed while they hear the game and all the rest of that fun stuff. Now, we can, uh, I'd like to work on uh, counter conditioning for sounds, and there's a lot of other things that we'd like to work on, but I think right now what we need is the floxetine to take effect, start getting into a habit of reward, celebrating the things the dogs do that we want, practice the front approach sit game that I had mentioned over there, and try to manage the situation and not have her around them, around people or situations that she's going to be reacted to. And counterpart is when the dogs are nice and mellow, that's a wonderful time to have the dogs all around. Now the X pen is nice because you can kind of divide the room up a little bit uh, or create an area that's fenced in where Birdie and uh, Jalapeno can hang in there and they can't get past that gate and that makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. It's, it's you know, cumbersome to sometimes have it out and about, but you know, it's a nice tool. I prefer using barriers over leashes because leashes, the dog can pull on the leash and that can create some frustration. The barrier just prevents them from getting close to each other. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else you want me to go over? Okay. Well, when you do think about stuff later on, you're going to have my cell phone number. Text me. I, I, there's no amount of text that is too many. I don't charge for that. I want you to text me. I have other videos. And the stuff that I've talked about here, uh, oh, I met, forgot the cookie in the corner. Make sure you Google Scent Games, S-C-E-N-T, and do that good cookie in the corner. If you get how to do it, I can send you a video of that and remind you how to do that. But if you can start doing some scent games where you have her sniffing around the house looking for a hidden treat or a hidden bait lure or something like that, that's a great way to drain energy. Also teaching her new tricks and cues. And that's why if your brother's teaching, you're both teaching, bang, you're dead. So he's doing it with Bernie over here. You're doing it with Nugget over there or in the back rooms or different parts of the house. But they're in the room together. Again, they're practicing doing something. And they have the same cues. Then you say bang and they both flap over. You know, again, those sort of things can be beneficial. Uh, just make sure you always increase the distance uh, if either dog gets stiff. Let's, let's, let's sign this up. Uh, finish this with body language. This dog's mouth in the, my mask is his Max. He's a dog that used to live with me. Um, Max's mouth is open in this video. A dog's normally relaxed. It's going to have an open mouth. Now, these dogs are asleep. That's why there's, uh, there's are closed. But they're going to have an open mouth, and they're going to be what I call wiggly and jiggly. See the ears here? See how the ears are kind of going back a little bit? I'm sorry. I don't want to mess with you too much. But basically the ears, uh, when I look at a dog's body language, the first thing I do is look at the tension in the body. Is the dog wiggly and jiggly or are they stiff and still? Stiff and still is not really all that great. 
If you see the dog's mouth go from an open to a close and the dog's stiff and still and stares at you or looks away, it's giving you a big warning. If you don't acquiesce to that or re respond to that, then you might get a, a lip curl or a growl or a bark or a lunge. And those are probably things that are gonna happen linearly. So if we can recognize the dog got stiff and still and we stopped and we moved the thing away, then the dog doesn't have to take it to the next level. So if learning to read your dog's body language can really help in reading not only just nuggets, but also these two dogs' body language. So the first thing I do when I look at a dog is I look at their overall body language. Are they stiff or are they relaxed? Mouth open or closed? Okay, then I look at their ears. Now you have very distinctive ears here with the Chihuahua. So if they're up here, that's kind of a neutral, that's what they're normal, that's, she's relaxed and that's why they are. If you see the dog a little bit more, more to the side, that's a little bit more accommodating. If they're fearful or uncomfortable or whatever, you're gonna see them flip or get pulled back. She has more of the traditional lab ears. So when you see the inside of the ear, this part is facing the, cheer, the cheeks, that's kind of humble. When you see them go way back, um, and that makes the dogs a little bit uncomfortable. And every dog's a little bit unique, unique pointy ears, flappy ears. So what I do is I look for the dog when it's neutral. I'm like this is neutral. This is what the dog's ears look like neutral. So once I can identify this is neutral, then when I know she's fearful, I look at the ears. What do the ears do different? Now they're way back. Okay, so that I can learn to read her body language. When her ears go back, she's uncomfortable. So I look at the tension of the body first, then I look at the breathing. Is the dog holding its breath or breathing panting, or is it breathing normally? Breathing normally, we're good to go. Um, next thing I do is look at the lean. Is the dog leaning towards us or away from it? If the dog's leaning towards you, it's probably, it might be ready to come to you. If it's leaning away from you, it's insecure and uncomfortable. Um, then I look at uh, the dog's, uh, uh, the head. Is it up, is it down, is the nose up, is the nose down? And you can look at also the ears and the rest of that stuff. Uh, then I look at the tail. Is the tail staying straight up and stiff? That's a big warning. I'm on alert, I'm on patrol. If it's, if it's waving and kind of a la uh, very fast movement, that's probably not a good thing. Waving kind of in a slower movement, that's better. If this is the dog's spine and the dog's head is right here and this is, my arm is the tail, if I up here is more alerting, back here parallel with the spine is kind of middle, uh, is kind of a good relaxed. Or just hanging down like a dog's natural body language is great. If it's coming up between the legs, that's an indication it's uncomfortable. You see those ears changing. So once you start looking, you can identify your dog's body language when it's neutral, then you start looking for changes. What happens to my dog's ears? their body weight, uh, their body positioning, their stiffness, uh, their uh, breathing, their tail, when they're excited or when they're fearful or when they're territorial. So if you can start to read all the dog's body lines, you can actually telegraph and under, or not telegraph, but you understand what Nugget's telling you before she needs to do it. And again, the more that you get out of the situations without her needing to growl or do anything, the less she needs to do that. Now I'd like to, now if you have any questions, please text me or call me. I'm always available for you. I would like to come back in about a month and spend a one hour just working on some other things based on where we're at. This is kind of a little bit of a disjointed. You guys had so many questions, which is wonderful, but we probably could, there's some stuff from this session we could probably add on to. Even, uh, I would like to pack more in, but we're at this point where I think four hours. Well, I wouldn't know, but my watch is dead. That's how long it's been, uh, but I'm happy to do it. So, uh, all right, well, this is my buddy. Um, uh, this is Jalapeno. This is Birdie. Nugget is off camera, and this is Nugget's Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.